So welcome to part two of BrainPickings.com and the Bible. <clears throat> um, there's some really good thoughts uh, that uh, Maria Popova has put together that um, compare and contrast well with the scriptures. Uh, she basically comes at it from the reality piece, a uh, fair amount of reason put in, and uh, kind of neglects the revelation piece. But uh, as we go through that, you'll see there are things that are helpful and things that are not. Um, she basically went through, and for those of you who missed part one, and after all her reading, three to five books a week, and a bunch of other stuff, essays, um, kind of went back over, over the 12, now 14 years, and uh, kind of picked the favorite uh, piece that she thought would be helpful. And uh, as I looked at them, I thought they'd be helpful for her, her body as well. Uh, the first one, which we looked at last week, is allow yourself the uncomfortable luxury of changing your mind. Uh, the Christian life is one of growth. It's one of change. Uh, you've got to change or you're kind of dead, spiritually at least. And uh, that kind of works the same way. If your cells aren't growing and renewing, uh, your body dies. So the, the thing I wanted to take away from is you really need to evaluate yourself. Uh, take heed and beware scope it out your life and uh, see really what it is that you occupies your thoughts of what occupies your thoughts of the future as well and then you also need to take heed about what you're building on because eventually uh, what you build is going to be tested by fire <clears throat> and uh, if what you built was the easy stuff the wood hay and stubble you will promise from God suffer loss you'll be saved but everything else gets burned up in fire but if you dig do the hard stuff the finding the stuff that's below the surface like the gold silver precious stones um, you will be rewarded do nothing for prestige or status or money or approval alone um, in the past uh, yeah, prestige is kind of related to approval prestige is the biggie set status uh, money they all kind of relate to people want power because people who have money want more power um, a lot of people who uh, you know, their major goal in life is to just get approval. Uh, we really should be seeking the approval of God. Therefore, we should do all for the glory of God, not for the glory of ourself. Uh, you can do these things for your eternal glory. In fact, you're commanded to do things like lay up treasure in heaven by Jesus. Um, but the temple glory, eh, it's, uh, you can't be a friend of God if you are a friend of the world. So that was last week. We heard testimony of this in our praise time. Be generous with your time and your resources. Um, because it is more blessed to give and receive, and with the measure that you use to give, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, flowing over. Okay. This one. Um, build pockets of stillness into your life. Uh, meditate. Those are her words. That's also the scriptural word to revolve in your mind, looking for implications for applications. Uh, Daily Truth based on Joshua 1, uh, 8, 9 tells you about that. Uh, and this one's going to lead into the next one. The purpose of life is not survival till you die. There's a purpose for which God has you on this planet. And if you miss that, you've missed out on life. Um, Psalm 23, God gives us stillness if we have him as our shepherd. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. Uh, leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So you need to be uh, still and know that he is God. Not just be still, but know that he's sovereign, he's in control, he's working out things for good. Uh, you need just to figure out what his will is so you can do it. Uh, then I kind of left off on this one. I, I, dabbled or dipped into the next one um, and I it was asked a question on this one which I gave you a supplement in the email that uh, I'll address in a minute but uh, she quoted a, a black woman who grew up in the midst of much depression and uh, kind of made a name for herself uh, being kind of noble and she said, the original quote is, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Uh, Maria kind of 
mess the code up deliberately for her purposes because she wants to be uh, she's, she's grinding some axe. But th there's some truth to this um, about not letting when people tell you who you are, don't believe them. Uh, yeah, you kind of want to know what God thinks of you, and you want to be seeking out what God thinks of you. And because of our capacity for self-deception, God has put us in bodies that can help us see, reflect to us who we are. You know, it's not just what we say we are, it's who we are by our deeds and actions. So uh, if you just measure yourself by uh, yourself, you're not wise. Uh, if you measure yourself by where you came from, yeah, that's good, and most people don't know that. But you really need to measure yourself by, by Christ-likeness. Are, are you becoming more like Christ? And uh, you know, Jesus asked people who they said that he was, so he could show that he was the great I Am. Um, we kind of need to get other people's perspective. We need to seek it out not be dependent upon it, but just make sure we're not being deceived. How do you know you're not deceived? So I left it with uh, Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice and accept instruction, that in the end you may be wise. And, and this instruction in Proverbs is not always uh, just a scripture. Uh, obviously, advice should be biblically based, and instruction should be biblically based, but it's not just straight scriptural verses, because this scripture in principle covers every aspect of our life, but in specifics, it doesn't. So the question was asked, which I'll show on the next screen, uh, about if you struggle with discernment, does that mean you're immature or a scoffer? And I answer that basically just out of Psalm 1, and, uh, I, you know, and some of the stuff in Hebrews that's coming up. And then as I hit Proverbs 13, I came across the scoffer again on the 13th of, uh, what is this, July? And it kind of brought back the question, and I started reading the rest of the uh, chapter in light of that question. And then I read a whole bunch of other Proverbs in light of that, and I looked up the word scoffer, and I realized yeah, I kind of didn't give you as good an answer as uh, you should have to be able to take appropriate action. So. How do I get rid of it? Ah, that's it. So let, let's define discernment. Uh, it's a basic word of like being put together two things to, to see what's really there. But for our purposes as followers of Christ, discernment is really a sensitivity and receptivity, receptivity to the spirit of God, who's also the spirit of truth. I even put, yeah, I to put the truth down there. So he's called the spirit of truth. He guides us in truth, and we need to be receptive to him. He's at work in us to willing to do God's good pleasure. So we need to be able to discern God's good pleasure. We need to be able to discern how things look from God's sight. And uh, I guess I've been doing this for 35 or so years. People don't have discernment. Uh, they don't have a sensitivity or receptivity to the spirit of God. And I'm not just talking about people sitting in pews. I'm talking about people who teach in graduate institutions, people who teach in churches, um, they, they just, you can eventually see that what they're saying does not match the word of God in many cases. So are they immature? Um, yeah, a, a two-year-old is immature. They think the world revolves around them. And that's their worldview. Uh, if a younger sibling is born, they resent it. If, you know, share your toy, what? Share my toy with that? <laughs> no, because um, my worldview is like, I'm the center of it. Don't give anybody else attention, give me attention. Uh, and if you're not just, if you're growing, then you can become more aware of other things. But if you scoff at it, if you, you know, wind up uh, walking in the way of sinners or standing in uh, the seat of whoever, and someone, and then you wind up taking up your residence in that of scoffers, you're people who devalue and ridicule the truth. Um, so my definition of scoffer up here is insensitivity to the Holy Spirit, his word, and his body. Uh, I always capitalize body because it, it basically it's God inhabiting us. Um, 
I also capitalize the pronouns just to annoy Satan and I give him lowercase. But anyway, so if you struggle with discernment, yeah, you're either immature or you are a scoffer. Um, it isn't the only, you're insensitive to the Holy Spirit. So how do you kind of become wise? Well, Hebrews 12, I mean 4, 12, and this is coming up under another section later, says that the word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You need to have discernment about what you think, discernment about what you intend, discernment about your ambitions. The heart is where you make your decisions. You need discernment about your decisions. Otherwise, you'll miss the will of God. And the word is what helps us do that. Um, then the next chapter, the author kind of, he reproves them, maybe even rebukes them, and says, you know, he, he, you ought to be teaching others, uh, but you're, you're babes, and you can't even handle solid uh, meat. You, you just have to be fed milk. Things have to be watered down just so you can digest them because you haven't developed uh, the skills of in taking God's word. So the, he says, un, the one who's immature is unskilled in the word of righteousness, the word about what's right in God's sight, for he's a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are full age or mature, same word gets translated both ways. And here's the thing, whose senses are exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, the senses, what you see, are trained by practice. That's the word. Uh, and instead of senses, the Net Bible and a couple others, the Net Bible was uh, put together by the guy who taught my advanced Greek grammar class and, uh, is, you know, and a group of guys like that. that so I always uh, make sure I understand why they're saying what they're saying. And perceptions is a great translation. The perceptions are trained by practice to discern both good and evil. So uh, they say that you know, the FBI trains counter, uh, their agents to detect uh, counterfeit currency, not by studying counterfeit currency, but by studying the real thing. And if you basically have trained yourself to see things from God's perspective, with, which ain't natural, all right? it's not just going to happen. You have to work at making this happen. It becomes pretty easy to see what's in accord with the truth and what's not in accord with the truth. But people really don't understand the truth. They don't understand it in context. Christians exist on an oral tradition. Um, and they really are babes who can just mouth what they've heard, or just kind of regurgitate what um, they've been fed. And they really have not trained themselves, I'm going to talk about this later under mindfulness, uh, to discern both good and evil. So I'd encourage you as you go through Proverbs this month, to just look at it from the perspective of what does this say about um, how you can train yourself to discern good or evil. 13.1. Well, sure. Um, just to be, I guess in that process of developing the maturity or discernment, I think one thing that can happen is you can start to try to make a judgment call on things prematurely and to exercise discernment. Um, but one of the proverbs that's always been pretty sobering for me is he who justifies the wicked and he who contends the just, both of them alike, are an abomination to the Lord. So is it better to judgment if you recognize you're still in process of developing discernment and just keep getting more information? Like, what is your advice there? Wow. Okay, that's, that's a great insight, a great verse to keep in mind. <laughs> Because, as we remember, we we're studying in Romans uh, was it 14, the one who judges incorrectly brings judgment upon himself. So, um, yeah, it's wise to, well, peace, it's wise to withhold judgment. It's good to have humility to ask questions to understand. Um, Church leaders are and spiritual people, Galatians 6, are actually commanded to exercise judgment to be able to see things. But, you know, the, uh, you know, prideful little toddler wants to, you know, be a big person. 
So as a result, they, they're going to go around judging folks. Like you saw this a lot, even though I was a very young Christian. I saw some other young Christians in college fellowship, you know, just going around judging because, oh, they learned something and now they're going to judge everyone else. Uh, and they really uh, were not uh, benef beneficial. The, the thing you need is a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, a sensitivity to his word, and then a sensitivity to his body. So, you know, the Holy you can't live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. You can't discern what God wants without the Holy Spirit guiding you. Uh, particularly in this word, there are spots like don't answer a scoffer or do answer a scoffer. Oh, which one do I apply? Because they, they say the same thing. Um, and you need the Spirit to guide you into which is the correct, actually those verses tell you, uh, way to go. So, yeah, you, you, it, there's so, so many people who think they know because they've heard from someone else. Uh, but you examine that with the truth. Jesus basically said to you know, the scribes and Pharisees, you know, you err because you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. Or even your personal standards. Oh, Some per people yeah. put their personal standards to be God's standards without sanctifying them. Oh, that is a great point. Personal standards, people put their personal standards as God's standards without being sanctified. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's coming up um, because that's is a real problem with people uh, thinking that they don't really are, are not metamorphosized by the renewing of their mind. So they're still caterpillars and they, they're trying to pretend they're butterflies and they don't have the perspective that a butterfly has. They're stuck in the weeds. Um, so, yeah, it's good to uh, err on the side of caution. Follow up? Yeah, well, just, um, I guess, one other point, I think it could be easy to um, be deceived if, if kind of a core of the definition without um, a receptivity of the Spirit of God is putting two things together. Um, you could be deceived that you have discernment if you're just putting putting pieces together, but without God's perspective, but you're just kind of doing it on your own, but it, then you say, well, I'm being discerning because I'm putting things together, but it's not governed by the truth. Right on. That is that makes sense. exactly I mean, right. I'm, 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 yeah, I like do that naturally, put things together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, um, you know, uh, governed by the spirit of truth or is God's standard. That's where it's my responsibility to make sure that it is. Yeah, and that's why, like Galatians 6, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, watching yourself lest you also be tempted. Uh, it, it's really disciple making is a team effort to you know try to figure out and get perspectives and particularly it's the job of church leaders to figure out what God wants to do with his sheep that he's entrusted to you um, so you, you get multiple perspectives and then you you know like they did in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 13 uh, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to basically have people uh, you know, not follow the rules of the, the Jewish uh, separatism. And they put a couple things that would be helpful for building unity between the Jews and Gentiles going forward. So, yeah, good thoughts. Uh, a wise son heeds his father's instruction. So take heed. It's instruction. The scoffer does not listen to rebuke, does not uh, value it, does not accept it. Um, the word for listen has this concept of value, one of the things I was looking up. He who despises the word will be destroyed. A hey, precious promise from God. Uh, but he who fears the command will be rewarded. Uh, the instruction or teaching of the wise, and I think a couple of versions actually you know, think that this is the law. Um, yeah, but it's not just teaching the law because there are other verses on that. Uh, this word for instruction is used of both human instruction and Bible instruction. Uh, and the wise is a person who basically look at Psalm 1 has, and not Psalm 1, Proverbs 1 has uh, gained God's perspective and then teaching others. And actually Proverbs is a book of uh, David passing on to Solomon uh, God's ways. And it's a fountain of life. It's to turn people away from the snares of death. It's not to have everybody, you know, turn left at the same time or right at the same time. You know, it's, it's, it's just external. But this, the interaction 
for which we need discernment is to prevent people from getting ensnared by the evil one. And a snare is something that you don't see. You know, you've know, you seen these in movies and stuff like that where they have a, a lasso or kind of a noose on the ground and they cover it over with leaves so the people or the birds don't see it. And they put some bait in the middle and then the naive babe, the toddler, you know, wanders right in to their death or hang it upside down and get eaten by the giant. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards, that word for regard is when it's value, I think, uh, a rebuke will be honored. And then it's an abomination to the fools to depart from evil. Wow. All right. So the, their, their values are so screwed up that they think the horrible thing is to depart from what they're doing. But the default is you're going to be doing evil. The default is not that you're doing good. You, caterpillars are, you know, get the wrong values. He who walks with the wise, next verse, will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Uh, it was really cool the way God this, used this in my life once. Uh, I was having a quiet time and I came across this verse and said, oh, that's a really good verse. And then later that afternoon, um, the uh, regional director of the NAVs invited me to live with him. And, uh, I kind of knew he did this kind of thing and I thought about it and thought, you know, walking with the wise would be good. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, thank you. And he said, okay, so why do you want to live with me? I said, well, I just happened to read Proverbs 13, 20 in my Proverbs this morning. It says, he who walks with the wise will be wise and I think you're wise and uh, I want to gain some of that wisdom. And I was in. A couple of days later, I came across this one and I'm thinking through, you know, still this uh, idea of what did Proverbs say about uh gaining wisdom from others. The scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise, which means they're going to stay stupid. They're stuck on stupid. A, a couple unbelievers actually use that terminology. Um, and stupid is actually a translation of the NIV, so it's an okay biblical word <laughs> uh, in some of these things. But yeah, so what happens if you don't love someone who corrects you, you basically heap up more judgment upon yourself by judging them. And then you stay stupid because you won't go to the wise for help. You lack the humility. It, it, like, remember, Satan's, the thing that got, brought him down was his pride. And that's his, one of his major tools to bring people down and keep them caterpillars. He doesn't, you know, you're born again. He can't do anything about that. But he can sure make sure you don't reach the fulfillment and the goal that God has for you because he doesn't want to see God give you glory. So I would encourage you as you go through Proverbs um, to give, you know, thought to what it says about stuff like this. You can do the word study on scoffer, but that, as you see from these verses, doesn't, uh, you know, it is actually mentioned in all the verses with that particular word. So you, you do the proverb of the day, uh, in a month you'll be through it, and uh, you can just, if you use a paper Bible, put a little, you know, green or red check mark next to these guys. Okay, any last questions? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> how should one respond to a scoffer? Ah, how should one respond to a scoffer? Wow. Well, a scoffer is wiser in their own eyes than seven people who can render a reason. You know, they, 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 they aren't reasonable. You, so you can try to reason with them. And then when they reject that, um, you know, we, God rejects those who reject him. Tell the disciples when you go out. They don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet. Wow, it's like you just walked into town and you're not going to win a hearing. Well, they were receptive to God and God was working in their lives. Um, then they would be receptive. Uh, to, you know, to be told not to cast, by Jesus, not to cast our pearls, pearls before swine because they'll turn again and render you. So when you realize, uh, you know, I've gotten a number of wounds by probably spending too much time trying to uh, help people avoid judgment. Uh, Paul tells Timoth uh, Titus in chapter one that elders are supposed to you know, know the truth so they can convict, uh, reproof uh, those who are wrong. But then in chapter three, he says, you know, reject, uh, some of the versions say divisive man. Uh, I think King James has a heretic. The real word is someone who chooses their own way. Uh, after the first and second admonition.
So two strikes, you're out. I guess it's the third one. So you won them once, you won them twice. They still be insist on being stuck on stupid. All right. And yeah. that's in the context of the body. That's in the context of the body. Okay, when you got fools outside the body or scoffers outside the body, um, you, you have to evaluate, is the interaction uh, draining? Is the interaction um, profitable? Is it having any effect? Um, and, you know, there are a couple of people that um, in uh, the past couple of years that I've come across that uh, I put, invested a lot of time in because they kept showing up in my life. And uh, then eventually I said, hey, you know, you, you just, you're, you're, they said they were stuck on stupid. I said, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I keep bringing up uh, reasonable uh, responses to what you say, and you do not have any responses to what I say, and you just keep parroting the same stuff. So uh, unless you really want to, you know, I actually said develop some humility and look at something from another perspective, there's no point in this relationship. So Jesus did not spend all his time running after the Pharisees, saying, guys, listen, guys, you got to listen. You know, he didn't. I uh, Matthew 23, he denounced them with woes that are, you know, uh, pretty potent. So, and then uh, I'll reference again the Sermon on Garden Ministries for Garden Variety Christians of you, you teach, you warn, word for admonish, uh, you encourage them, then you admonish them, and then you encourage them, and you admonish them, and then it comes to reproof where you actually, okay, bring to light. You're doing this. The scriptures say this. How do, how do you how do you reconcile those two? And then if they still do not see the light, reproof means to bring to light. Uh, then you say rebuke means you're wrong. Uh, in Hebrew, the word for rebuke and the word for reproof are the same thing. So it's kind of you have to maybe figure it out from the context. Um, and then eventually uh, it comes to the point where you reject them. Matthew 18 tells you some of the principles. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you know your brother has something against you, you go to him. Matthew 18 says uh, kind of, I think, the same thing. If you have something against your brother, you go to him. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. If not, then you bring some other people. You get the body involved. And then if they won't hear the body, then it's, you know, sign art. Um, I don't think we can be holier than God. Jesus rejected people who didn't want truth. He told the disciples to reject people who didn't want truth. We're told by the Holy Spirit to reject people who persist in that. Why do, why do we keep our time on um, people who don't want to know truth? Well, if, if we're related to them, yeah, okay, you're stuck with them. So uh, then you kind of go through the things under uh, how to resolve conflict and uh, resolve, uh, remove, resolve, or reduce sources of conflict. Uh, resolve, re whatever the order is. Um, yeah, so that's what Jesus did. That's what the disciples did. Well, why do we think we're so much wiser and better than they? In the Old Testament, he told them to stone them. Okay. <laughs> you can't do that. Get your pebbles here. All right, so the next one. Uh, this one, really, I, I spent more time on this than I, do, than I spent doing some word studies, uh, trying to figure out what in the world do they mean by presence. Uh, so, uh, I think I, it's, it, it means so many different things to people, particularly in our current culture, and I needed to find the author's in, uh, original meaning of presence. So I had to go through her work and find out who she referenced and read their work. And here she actually quoted one that I think is kind of what she wants. So presence is far more intricate and rewarding in art than productivity. And what I shared last week, ours is a culture that measures worth as human beings by our efficiency, our earnings, our ability to perform this or that. The cult of productivity has its place, but worshiping at its altar every day robs us of the very capacity for joy and wonder that makes life worth living. So she's looking for the original author. What do you, the capacity for joy and wonder that makes life worth living? What makes life worth living for this person? Oh, joy and wonder, finding something new, something that makes me happy. And she actually talks about finding joy in, uh, 
you know, an old guy and his dog waiting to cross the street. They both have gray hair and they look at each other and that gives her joy. Or the little girl goes back uh, by riding her bicycle and her pigtails are flying behind her and she's taken on the world and that gave her a moment of joy. Um, that's really not joy. We'll, we'll get to what joy is, but this is, the, this is our Maria's uh, concept of it. She quotes a Harvard uh, Business School professor who's done a lot of research into this because uh, she had some accident that really diminished her IQ and some other things. Uh, she has, I didn't get a chance to listen to it, the second most, at the time of the writing, second most popular TED Talk. And it, it it's in it, the gist of what I got from when she referenced her TED Talk was uh, basically being who you are. But uh, let's go back to Professor Cuddy's research. Is the I, uh, She's talking about the imposter syndrome. That, that's where you reach some success, but you don't feel like you are worthy of it. You feel you're going to be found out. It creates some guilt, some anxiety, a uh, sense of unworthiness. Uh, so she's addressing that. Uh, and it makes you feel powerless. The ultimate fuel of the imposter syndrome is powerlessness. You really don't feel like you have real power. And basically, the solution to it is recognizing how you got there and uh, realizing that you're not an imposter. And if luck had its uh, sway in your life to get you where you are, which is true of m most successful people, will say that it, there's an element of luck involved to be worthy of that luck by rising to the new occasion as opposed to staying who you are, but that's another story. So the opposite of the powerlessness isn't power, but what she terms presence. And then she says it's the ability to inhabit and trust the integrity of one's own values, feelings, and capabilities. And when I read that immediately, my discernment alarm went off saying, ah, there's something very wrong about this. Um, and she said, this capacity for presence is the seedbed of confidence, courage, and resilience required to rise even the most daunting of life's challenges. Okay, so what's right and wrong about this? Well, to inhabit means to live and then trust the integrity of one's own values, feelings, and capabilities. The key word here is integrity. And uh, there's like, this has, a lot of it is used in ethics. Um, what you see is what you get. Um, it's the thing that kind of helped me understand it is to its use in, uh, like a piece of metal has integrity. If it, um, doesn't have the weak spots, it, it, it you know, a, a, a bond has integrity if it's well bolted together and it's going to hold up under um, uh, stresses. So what she's calling presence is the ability to live and trust your feelings, values, and capabilities, but trust that they are right, not just that you they're yours. And the focus is on one's own values. And the world's values are totally wrong. In fact, she her whole writing is geared towards undoing some of the world's values, like the cult of productivity down here. Feelings are stuff, ephemeral things. Uh, it's how you feel at the moment. And you, you know, are, feelings are a roller coaster. Feelings are a result of perceptions. Perceptions are formed by value filters. And you can feel the wrong thing in a situation. <clears throat> and capabilities, okay, so yeah, that's, that's good. I found out that people who have been able to deny themselves for sports teams, deny themselves for, um, you know, grinding out the stuff at work and gr even academically grind out the stuff, having grit. A grit is a great word, which we don't use much. And I came across this and studying this a little deeper. People who have that, the ability to stick to it until it's done, uh, then gives you a greater uh, capacity to do that for the future. Now, this capacity for presence is a seedbed of all this other stuff. Uh, yeah, from a biblical perspective, it's really your ability to trust God and his values is really the right thing. But presence has another aspect, and I'm, I'm going to, I think I address this in the next, or, yeah, in the next issue. Um, most people call presence being present. 
and I'm sure there's a little bit of that. It's not being distracted by uh, other things. Uh, when you are talking to someone and you're thinking about all kinds of other things and you even look at your phone, you're not present. Uh, the solution to that kind of thing is what people think of as mindfulness. So I saw the term mindfulness for a number of years, and when I finally got around to exploring what they really meant by it, I said, because I had an idea that it was just not thinking of anything. And uh, after exploring it more, I realized, yeah, it's pretty close. And then someone said, it's a billion dollar business. There are apps that, you know, $250 million are the value of these apps that help you just be mindful. And what mindful is, is you're mindful of the things that your senses feel, like the chair that you're sitting on, the pressure of one foot against another, the temperature in the room. It's taking your mind off uh, the things you're thinking about that are worrying you and bring them back to nothingness. And uh, some of that comes out of Eastern mysticism, so I'm weary of it. However, there's... In your quiet time, if your thoughts are wandering, uh, Satan is not just snatching um, truth from your mind. Mindfulness can be helpful with simple breathing exercise. There's some corporations now that just you know, have pauses in the middle of their workday to have people spend a minute or two minutes just focusing on their breath and counting you know, four in, hold it for four, Exhale for four, hold it for four, count in. And uh, I remember trying to help my mom as she was dealing with uh, some of her issues in her final days, that that was actually helpful to get her off the feelings of pain and death and onto, uh, you know, just break the chain. Uh, touching someone also can sometimes break the chain and bring them out of the craziness that they're in back into the present. A lot of people focus on the past or they focus on the future, they don't focus on the present. And that ability to uh, control your thoughts and your feelings is essential, and we'll talk about it shortly. So that, that's another use of presence, where it's mindfulness, being mindful of what you're doing. Um, you know, I noticed that as I was looking to see how that applied to my life. Uh, when I cook or actually do anything... Uh, what do you call it, physically, uh, I'm very conscious of, I, I think about other things, but I'm also very conscious of what I'm doing and what's the best way to do it, what's the most efficient way to do it, and uh, you know, then as a result, I, have, I can live a more effective and efficient life. But if I'm thinking off on other stuff first before I've mastered how to do the thing you know, in the most efficient way, uh, then I you know, cut myself. So the key to this is actually something on the next screen, but I'll wait. Let me just finish up her quote. Uh, the cult of productivity and worshiping at its office, uh, altar daily robs us of the very capacity for joy and wonder, which for her makes life worth living. And then she quotes someone who says, how we spend our days, of course, is how we spend our lives. In one of the articles that she had cited, they said, the average life consists of two years of boredom. This is not like, you know, 2001, I mean, 20, 2021 and 2020, were years of boredom. This is talking about the number of minutes that add up to a year. You spend six months watching commercials. Uh, that's uh, over a quarter million commercials. And if they're uh, you know, half-minute commercials, it gets even greater, and I'm going to do a little fun thing on that. You spend 67 days, it's a little over two months, in heartbreak, and only 14 minutes of pure joy. Whoa. All right, so my first response to that is that a life of sensation, of capacity for joy and wonder, of feeling a certain experience, is a life of greed and greed is a desire for more and it's addictive and you keep wanting more and more and more and the reason you want more and more and more is because it doesn't satisfy you need to wake up to this and i thought 
most people are just wishing zombies. They're the walking dead that go around instead of living life for the will of God in the present, they're wishing for something else in the future. And they fail to recognize that the God has given them the present days for them to learn and perform, even if and that learning is involving sitting at Jesus' feet. So I, I took the six months of watching, I took it and I said, okay, that's half a year. Let's divide that by two, get the number of days in a year times 24 hours a day. And that gives us four and a quarter uh, hundred hours of watching commercials. I then was trying to figure out how to get this more real to you. So I said, let's say you go to work and for the first three hours from 9 a.m. to noon, uh, you just watch commercials. That's all you do at work. Every minute of every hour, you are focused on commercials, which are messages designed to create in you discontent. Uh, that would equal uh, almost one and a half thousand work days. So then I divided those by a five day work week and I got the number of, I think the math is okay in this, almost 300 work weeks. And then I figured, okay, you get at least two weeks of vacation in most spots. You get a week worth of holidays, you know, five days, maybe more. And then you get some sick days thrown in. That equals six years of watching commercials every day when you go to work from 9 a.m. to noon. What a waste. I can add to that what programs were watched. Actually, we can dispense with commercials with a Netflix subscription. It's probably worth it. But then they give you previews to get you to watch more stuff and get you hooked. All right, so what, what's a biblical perspective on this idea of presence versus productivity? Presence is contrasted with purpose. The thing that saves us from worshiping at the cult of productivity is asking, why do we do this? Why were we made? What, what's the purpose of putting in this extra time? Um, what's the purpose of life? Uh, you want a focused and receptive rational response to life as opposed to whatever you feel like. Focused. You need to keep on focused on your purpose. You need to be receptive to what God is doing through the events that come into your life. And you need to figure out what kind of response do you need? Worship is a cognitive response to God, to what he's done. So in obedience, when Abraham offered to sacrifice his son, that was a very cognitive decision. It's not, oh, goody, I get to go and worship, you know, kill the thing that I wanted most in life. Uh, he said, the boy and I will go worship and then we will return to you, plural. So we reckon the resurrection. But most people, when things come in, because they have not trained themselves, they have a caterpillar response uh, that just keeps them in the weeds. They don't rise above the circumstances and they just, you know, get hurt by the thorns and eaten by the stuff that's down there. So in figuring out your purpose, you need to ask, why were you made? Uh, let's see. I'm, since we're talking about church, I'm going to think uh, we're made to glorify God. And enjoy him forever. Oh, those are actually pretty good. Okay, how do you glorify God? By being faithful. Oops, right there. Faithful and fruitful. You bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. Glorify God, John 15. That glorifies God, and it also glorifies us. Well done, good and faithful servant. Realizing we're made for this stuff, and you know, having it be the thing that affects your daily walk, as well as your responses to the curveballs in life. Listening to the praise time about TPT, it kind of made me think that's kind of like our modern George Mueller orphanages. <laughs> God allows the difficulties to come in so everyone else can be edified. Thank you, gals, for building us up like that. Uh, Ephesians 5, 15, um, kind of where it kind of sums up uh, the purposes of the body. This really starts in chapter 4 at the beginning and how the body is supposed to be linked to the head. They get taught to do that and then they can build each other up by speaking the truth and love and, and things that are going to prevent that from happening, self-centered behavior. He then says, walk as the wise, not as fools. Wise is good, fools are bad. 
very bad. Being a fool is fatal. Pain and suffering await you. And then walking as a wise person means you buy back the time. You pay the cost. Actually, you invest as well as pay to make the most of the time that God has given you. Because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be stuck on stupid. But understand, have insight into what the will of the Lord is. And he lists some things in terms of their interactions with each other. The climax is not be drunk with wine, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not some mystical thing. The Spirit of Truth gave you words to control you. And then he works within you to willing to do God's good pleasure. That's where a mystical piece comes in using the word. person who is filled with wine is controlled by that wine. A person who is filled with the Spirit is controlled by the Spirit. And then the climax of all the stuff of being filled with the Spirit is submitting to one another in the fear of God. And the reason that Paul ends on this is because the theme of Ephesians is having a unified temple um, in, where the body members are linked together under the headship of Christ. And the reason he throws in the fear of God is this is God's purpose. This is the purpose for, the, he said he will destroy those who destroy the temple. This is God's purpose of believers. And if you are not fulfilling his purpose for you, you'll lose. The verses I put on your outline previously is Mary and Martha. Mary sat at Jesus' feet in a proper position of humility and heard, valued his word. Martha had a different value. It wasn't fellowship with Jesus. It wasn't hearing Jesus' word. Notice, sitting at his feet is not the position of blessing, but it's sitting and hearing. Martha was all about serving. She was distracted with much serving. Serving's a good thing. The good is the enemy of the best. Working heartily as unto the Lord is a good thing, but make sure it's heartily as to the Lord. When you're working, be present in your work. Um, and Jesus rebukes her. You are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part. This is after Martha complained about Mary. Tell my sister to help me. I have to do all this work. Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted with many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part. Uh, you should too. And let's see if I do my... All right, yeah, okay, this is where I do the, uh, the piece on... <clears throat> Oops, I gotta get back. Sorry. So in the concept of... Uh, I thought about being present or being mindful. Um, I'd like to share some thoughts with you, and they're not written. On... Um, how how do you not have your feelings control you? Now, I've probably done it. I know I've done a sermon on self control and the ability to inhibit or exhibit an input, uh, an impulse, uh, and the perception and performance stuff is totally there. It's it's great background. It's it's all stuff that is you know bear the scrutiny of scriptures in real life. Um, the Greeks were really big on arete. And that was your passions were governed by objectives. It's governed by purpose. Uh, you didn't respond as how you felt. You responded according to some higher purpose. Uh, you know, Aristotle had the golden mean. And for all the virtues, he kind of said they were the middle of these two things, like fear or cowardice. The middle of that was courage or bravery. Um, Wait, the fear and cowardice on one side, and uh, foolhardiness, or, you know, uh, oh, what was his term? Uh, I can't remember it, but it's just r rushing into things without thinking. Um, it was a golden mean, and they, they spent a lot of time thinking about and they trained people, uh, their tutors for the rich, or arist aristocrats, aristocracy, um, to enable them to rule. 
was you couldn't just go on how you felt. You had to go on principles, otherwise you were not fit to be uh, an autonomous unit or part of the uh, ruling group. So uh, you've got two parts to your brain. There's the front part, prefrontal cortex, that handles the rational thought. And then you've got this underlying basal thing, I can't remember what they call it, but um, that's where your emotions are. And they are stronger than your prefrontal cortex. So I remember when I first studied neurobiology, uh, they talked about how uh, they train monkeys to do a task and then they sacrifice them. That's a euphemism for killing them, which always happens when you open up a brain to look inside. And uh, they noticed that the ones who've been trained to have done a particular test had developed a rut in their brain. And then the whole neuroscience of neurochemical uh, impulses, their electrochemical things, uh, they run through the path of least resistance, just like lightning. And they make a rut. And over time, uh, that rut controls the life. So if a kid grows up without with being fed on demand, with having uh, being sheltered from every hard thing, uh, basically modern day, uh, under 20, to you millennial, they go a little further up, so I don't know. I don't want to offend that age group, but uh, they they grow up with their feeling and they feel insecure. Oh, I need to be part of a group. Um, and you know there are all kinds of sociological studies that will kind of advocate this, but there are others that say no, that's not the right way. And the scripture basically says it's not the right way. Uh, you need to teach people self control, uh, really control of their feelings is the key thing. So you, you can start in your quiet time. Whenever you are feeling not like having a quiet time, you need to snap back your attention to what God has to say for you. If it takes doing a little breathing exercise for you know, 20 seconds, do it. Um, if it takes writing down whatever the thought is, okay, I'll get to that later, do it. I remember someone way back when said, yeah, that's a good way to your quiet time. If you're starting to think about something, just write it down and it'll be there if you have your quiet time. Um, but you, you need to basically align your feelings with God's feelings, your values with God's values. You can't let them run rampant because it will uh, lead you down the wrong path every single time. Just think of the six plus years you spend just being bombarded by commercials. Forget the billboards or what you hear or the actual content of TV shows. Uh, they're going to shape your thinking more than the Word of God will. Um, if you, you know, spent just a tenth of that time um, having God's Word and values and perspectives shape your thinking and actions and your purpose in life, uh, you would be profited both now in this world and also in eternity. So, you know, you, you got to come to grips first with the fact that your feelings are running away from you, or, or basically running your lives. And you need to take back control and develop more sense of presence. Uh, if you find yourself thinking about the past, don't, don't do that. Uh, you find yourself thinking about the future, there's a time for planning, uh, but don't spend all your time there. Uh, someone said, uh, the presence is what you've got. That's why they call it a present. <laughs> it's a gift. You got these, you know, 24 hours. Uh, use them as God wants you to. Now, like, thinking about the past is really good if you can learn from it. Often we kick ourselves for what we've done in the past, and it will keep running around in our brain. I shouldn't have done. Oh, what I said. I shouldn't have said that. Okay, so think about it. Why did you say it? And what are you going to do differently? One of the things I learned way early, uh, I think it was my last year of college or just right after I graduated, I came across Dennis Waitley's Psychology of Winning. And he, 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 he's, he's a Christian of sorts, and he trained uh, NASA astronauts, and he also deprogrammed POWs. He saw life you know, at the top and life at the bottom. And one, one of the things he said is that you, and it was kind of a, probably under the subset of as you think so you are, You'll see golf professionals on the tour, uh, and whenever they miss a putt, you'll see them just stand there, you know, back away for a foot, 
and then they will replay the shot in their mind. And what they're doing is they are programming their subconscious with the correct action. So they don't blow the putt on the next one. So you need to think about what it is that you've done that you don't like, why you didn't like it, and then you need to actually think through what would the correct response be. That's what I talk about in toil about 90% of our life is controlled by our robot. Our robot is controlled by most people's feelings. It's not controlled by our programming. And we need to think through how I, God wants me to respond. And we need to envision ourselves doing that. Uh, there's a sermon I put together called, on sanctification called It Ain't Gonna Rain No More. And sin is not going to reign over us anymore. And I talk about how to reckon yourself, mind thing, dead to sin and alive to God. It's, you know, it spells acrostics, and I think most of you have used it to profit. It's also one of those things worth like, reviewing every now and then. So whenever you find your emotions um, leading you to the wrong path, stop them so they don't dig the rut deeper. Then to block the rut, you start linking massive amounts of pain, mental and emotional, with going in the wrong direction. So you won't do it. You might even try linking some amounts of pain with having your mind wander and not focus on your quiet times. We don't think that, you know, not paying attention to God's word, destruction, yeah, that's, that's what happens at the end. So um, you, you need to proactively program in the correct response and then retroactively eliminate and there's ways to extinguish the response like send some stuff under perception and performance of the bad response uh those of you who are familiar with clockwork orange they programmed the guy to uh, avoid the antisocial behavior that uh, was the theme of the movie um you can basically when you think of something that is that used to be pleasurable to you now it is an abomination to you then you're in, and instead what's, what was something you didn't really care for is now something you value and want to do because you've linked happy feelings with it. Then you've got the, you know, joy and stuff that makes life worth living uh, that comes from really being, where's the word for it, having, having integrity. You've got solid biblical feelings values and uh, then you can use those to develop abilities and then you have something that's really worth rewarding okay any questions on that okay next week ah perfect one <laughs> expect anything worthwhile to take a long time you're an oak tree, you're not a mushroom. Mushrooms can grow up overnight. Oak trees take a long, long time, but they endure. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are at work in us to will to do your good pleasure. Uh, thank you that your desire and purpose for us being on this planet is to be conformed to the image of Christ, doing the things that he did so we receive the blessings that he did. Guide us so that we are like him in our actions. Help us uh, know him as revealed in the scriptures, not in folklore. Uh, help us see him in all his awesomeness, both in the Old Testament as the great I am, in the New Testament as the great I am, and in the future as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for this body. In Christ's name, amen.